Hello, and welcome to the Middle East Forum speaker webinar series and podcast. I'm Stacey Roman, and I will be moderating this discussion today. We are pleased to have David Collier, an investigative journalist focused on exposing anti-Semitism, join us to discuss explaining Ireland's extreme anti-Zionism. Mr. Collier will speak for 15 minutes and open it up for questions. Should you wish to ask a question, please use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen to type your question. And with that, I will turn the discussion over to Mr. David Collier. Well, firstly, thank you for thank you for that introduction. Um, thank you for joining here and thank you for inviting me. Um, look, I am actually I'm going to speak about Ireland, obviously. I need to give a tiny little background here for context. I um, hope you can all hear me OK. Uh, I'm completely independent. Um, what I do is undercover work looking at anti-Semitism within the anti-Zionist, anti-Israel movement. I spent several years uh, fully undercover. I had no public uh, persona at all. I put on a kafir and a, you know, a free Palestine badge, and I, I went in and I became one of them. For me, it was the only way I felt I could actually immerse my, by immersing myself in it, could actually understand the ideology and the drivers of what was taking place around us. I started in England, um, which is obviously my home base. And because I, I, I was invited to all their groups, um, I, I knew all who they were, I actually managed to quantify it. I could take a group, for example, a demonstration, 120 people at a demonstration, most of them I knew, most of them were my friends on Facebook, so I could look at what it is they were sharing. And in, the, in England, I got to about 40%, basically 40% of the people that turn up at these demonstrations were sharing materials such as Holocaust denial, Rothschild conspiracy, the Jews did 9-11, that kind of stuff. So it's all hardcore anti-Semites, about 40%. From England, I went off to Scotland. And in Scotland, it was worse. It was about 50%. But it was in Scotland that I noticed a bridge between the Scottish, uh, you know, the Scottish independence movement and the Irish Republicans. So when I'd finished with Scotland, I went over to see what was happening in Ireland. And it was there that Basically, I was shocked at what I found. Um, the first major difference between England, Scotland, and Ireland was that in England and Scotland, we have a government that's pretty pro-Israel, relatively speaking, and everything is moderated through that. Um, in Ireland, that isn't the case at all. Um, the, the Irish are effectively anti-Israel from the core, whereas, for example, in England or France or Germany or in the US, we have governments that understand and recognize the boycott movement, BDS for what it is, and start legislating or trying to legislate against uh, the evil that is effectively behind it. In Ireland, it's the opposite. The government are actually trying to legislate in favor of it. They've put forward, for example, the um, um, uh, motion to stop buying goods uh, uh, made in the settlements, which basically is just a backdoor into full Israeli boycott anyway. Uh, because you've got banks that, for example, like Anclumi and so on. So as soon as you start boycotting goods that are made in the settlements, you're boycotting all of Israel. So this is, this is a top-down approach. Rather than people on the streets agitating for change and trying to petition the MPs, then we actually have the politicians who are trying to push the people towards anti-Israel activism. And it's really visible. I mean, I saw a, um, a sitting Irish politician liking a post on Facebook that said Hitler wasn't wrong. This is a sitting politician. If in England or Scotland we were to find such a politician, he'd be out of job in a day. But the Irish just didn't care. No, no, we didn't even get a column inch about it. Not a single newspaper was prepared to write about it because the media sits with them, as it does in most countries. I mean, we, the media sits basically within an Overton window around the government and the opposition. So in Ireland, the media is also extremely hostile to Zionism and the state of Israel. So what's happening is, is on the street, rather than people moderating their views because they're worried about being accepted in society, we have a reverse effect where everything becomes amplified. It really doesn't matter what they say. The, the Holocaust denial, Rothschild conspiracy, horrific Zionist, anti-Zionist rhetoric that's just passed off as normal speak. Um, it's turned the campuses there or some of the campuses into very, very hostile environments for Jewish people. But what's, what, what's actually taking place there and the differences? I mean, firstly, we have the main difference, which is the anti-colonial position of Ireland. 
with England and, and, and Scotland, of course, they don't like them very much over there in Ireland. Ireland, quite anti-British. So that the first thing that's happening is you've got Britain is seen through the Balfour Declaration, um, through the obviously inaccurate anti-Zionist rhetoric that Britain gave the Jews Israel. But this is seen as being the truth. So obviously they hate England, so therefore they're anti-Israel. Um, well, I mean, historically, of course, we know the PLO and the IRA had deep, deep ties at times. Um, so you've got this, this um, distinct anti-colonial strand going through the whole of Irish politics. And the rise of Sinn Féin, which is obviously historically the Republican independence movement party, if you like, um, as they've been getting stronger over the last few years, is becoming more and more dominant in Irish politics. A second um, area is the anti-Semitism, the classic anti-Semitism. So on, on top of the fact that um, the Irish see the British and see the, the Jews as effectively colonial, settler colonialism, we have the historical anti-Semitic strand that runs through Ireland as well. So it's one layer on top of the other. Uh, Ireland was officially independent uh, during the war, unaffiliated, but we do know, of course, that many of the Irish Republicans sided with the Nazis. Um, we know that the, I think it was the president who signed the condolence book after, after Hitler's death. So we have this type of issue taking place there as well, which is classic anti-Semitism. And it's odd that they're coming from separate sides, very much as we would see, for example, anti-Semitism coming from the far left and the far right in some parts of our own society. This is basically their opposites that we're also seeing over there. A third issue that um, I noticed was with religion. And we have a lot, as, as Jews in Israel, we have a lot of Christian friends. But there are some strands, some ideologies within Christianity that are problematic. Um, and they're very, very strong within the Irish Catholic Church, which is replacement ideology, supersessionism, or the idea effectively that the Christians are the new Jews. For these people, of course, who believe that the New Testament replaces the old and the Christians are the new, new Jews, the birth and the rebirth of the state of Israel. You know, that the fact that the Jews have once again taken their place in their historical homeland is a major ideological problem for them. So what we see is we see the church groups um, in Ireland, rather than aligning with uh, Israel and the Jews, they go the other way. They're aligning with the Palestinians. We see the large Christian charities there donating vast amounts of money to NGOs that are anti-Israel some of them no doubt affiliated to terrorist groups like the PFLP. And the final issue we have over there that's causing the problem is of course the uh, Islamist extremism. Now it's different in Ireland than it is from elsewhere. Firstly, they don't have a large, they don't or haven't had a large Muslim immigration. So, they haven't dealt with some of the issues that other Western nations have dealt with over the last two or three decades. And whereas, for example, obviously the US and the UK, we've learned um, through bitter experience uh, that we made many, many mistakes as we allowed um, Islamist extremism to take hold. In Ireland, they've had no such experience. And they're coming in speaking the same anti-colonial, anti-imperial messaging that um, the Irish do. So they have basically a shared language. And whereas in, in uh, obviously where we are, where I am, and where I, I would imagine many of you are, we, made, we all made the mistake about two or three decades ago of, of placing the bar for extremism far, far too high uh, so effectively, extremism is equated with violence. And when you're dealing with Islamist ideologies, it's a very, very bad mistake to make. And it's one that most of you have made two or three decades ago. And we're paying a very deep price for it now because it meant that we aligned with what we believed were moderate um, spokespeople, if you like, who were in fact just spreading hate via some of the mosques and some of the institutions. When Ireland, they've accepted them wholesale. 
So basically we have an issue there where we have uh, within, for example, a campus or a university, we have Islamist um, academics <laughs> alongside the hard left academics working with the local church all bashing the state of Israel. And it, it's created an environment where everything is continuous, like a, an escalation where over the last five or 10 years, it has become progressively worse. And because what we're seeing is Sinn Féin grabbing more and more of the, the power within the Irish political system, I believe that it will continue to do so. And, you know, I, I um, stopped doing talks on, um, on the local level because I normally ended up having to start with an apology uh, because I'm quite a pessimist when it comes to what's taking place around me. And I, I'm immersed in it. I'm not, I'm, I've got a bird's eye view of what's taking place. When I turn on social media, I don't see what most of you see. I see them and I see their friends and I see what they're talking about. Um, and history, history doesn't just happen. You know, we, we, we often say, okay, when something occurs, we can look back and it's very easy in hindsight to unpick what it is that occurred. I mean, when Hitler took power, for example, in 1933, it was just a, a continuation of what had been taking place in German politics for the last 13 or 14 years. The lines were leading towards these kind of events. And even if we turn around and we look at the Holocaust, for example, Holocaust didn't just happen. And it doesn't even trace back only to the ascent of Adolf Hitler. It goes back way back into European anti-Semitism and beyond into Christian, you know, Christian anti-Semitism. So you have to follow these strands and, and look at what's taking place to try to understand how, where we're going. And you know, I've, I've said, um, Many times uh, it, it's a very depressing situation as I see it in the island. When it, is, it does have its unique characteristics, but it does show us what is taking place on the ground that's being held down by pro pretty moderate government control. But what's taking place on the ground is still taking place on the ground here. And it's taking place on the ground in Scotland. And I know it's taking place on the ground in some places in the US. I only have to look at what, what's happening in some campuses to know that this is true. Um, so when we're dealing, as we were in the UK, with Corbyn and the threat of Jeremy Corbyn up until 2019, we were almost island. And it, this is what um, needs to be driven home, that what we're living in we're living in in all it's almost an illusion if you like uh, overconfidence that it's a long way away it's island and it's because of the, the, the catholics and it's because of this and it's because of that but it's not these are the people and these are the people unrestrained and what's taking place is taking place there now because the government agrees with the people they're actually in tune with each other so in england we have relatively, as I said, a pro-Israeli uh, pro government, which is great, but we almost didn't. And we have absolutely no idea whether in two years the Conservatives are going to win or whether we're going to see the Labour Party rise here, which will give us a problem because Corbyn, although Corbyn was defeated, Corbynism and Corbyn's uh, effective uh, cult, if you like, is still firmly entrenched within the Labour Party. So we could be here in the UK two years from being in the position of Ireland. And it, it, I think it's something that we you know, really need to consider when we're talking about what's taking place in other countries, because we can look at them and we can learn from them and we can see what's going on. And then we can try to look for similar patterns that are taking place in our own countries and dealing with those kind of dangers. Now, obviously, um, you know, I, I've been given the um, microphone for 15 minutes. I could talk for obviously much longer. I tried to be as quick and as thorough as I possibly could. I'll now hand back to you for, because I see the 15 minutes almost up, so I will hand back to you now for questions. And thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much. We have quite a few questions coming in. The first is from Donald Lewin. The first Lord Mayor of Dublin was a Jew and Zionist. He actively supported Israel and was a key contributor to the Irish war against the United Kingdom. 
um, in his autobiography. Uh, yeah. So what has happened since then? Well, that, it's, it's very simple. It, when Israel was being founded, if you think about it, the prime people that the Zionists were fighting were the British. We were up against the British army, especially post, obviously, 1945. You know, and then it was out and out war between them, basically. So for Ireland to be against the British, at the time the Zionists were against the British, there was an ali a alignment. So there was some, obviously, pro-Zionist feeling within the Irish community because they saw us as being an anti-British movement. Obviously, that has completely changed, which is why we're seeing a very, very different island today. Thank you. Jeffrey Cranes asks, does the di diaspora Irish community in the US share the same anti-Semitic views as the native Irish do, or do they try to serve as a moderating force? It's, a, it's actually a really good question. It's one that um, kind of confused me when I was doing the research, because I would have imagined, given like the support that Israel does have within the, the American community as a whole, that they, they would be a moderating force. I can't really answer the question because I'm not there. I'm not. I mean, you're much closer to that kind of issue than I am. And I didn't really look at it. And I, I don't want to answer the question. I don't really have the information to do so. Absolutely understood. David S. Levine asks, aren't the Ulster Protestants pro-Israel? <laughs> yes, <laughs> very much so. Um, but obviously, once you get north of, when, you, when you're talking about what's taking place in Northern Ireland, it's a completely different story. There, um, on, on one corner, you will have the Catholics putting up the Palestinian flag, and on the other, you'll have uh, the, the Protestants putting up the Israeli flag. And they actually take these flags to their marches because they now see them as identifiers so that they can identify which kind of which, which side they come on. But that's part of the Protestant, which is British, Catholic, which is Irish battle. So in, the, in, in Southern Ireland, in Ireland, in, in the country that is Ireland, that doesn't exist. And in Northern Ireland, which is under British, is part of the United like Britain, it, it, there are there is pro-Israeli uh, tendency. Thank you. And Robert Slater follows up on that. This is very depressing news. Any sign of favorable change or resistance to this anti-Semitism? Can you repeat that second? Any sorry, any sign of favorable change or resistance to this anti-Semitism? This is this is the 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 most worrying aspect is the lack of pushback. Um, you know, it, when, when we have anti-Semitism here, and I, I speak now from the UK, we adopted the IRHRA definition of anti-Semitism as a way of addressing the rise of anti-Semitism. We have a media that will um, uh, deal with anti-Semitism and talk about anti-Semitism. We, we have politicians uh, that want to talk about it. We're building a Holocaust memorial. There is an, an acceptance that, there has been a rise of anti-Semitism. There's an acceptance that it is threatening. There's an understanding because obviously in, in England, they know full well what the Nazis are. There's an understanding of where anti-Semitism can lead. So we have a lot of pushback here, um, which is great. But in Ireland, that's not the case. The media is far more likely to run out an article saying it's not anti-Semitism, it's anti-Zionism than they are to do an article on the problems of anti-Semitism. And what they do is it, it's a classic leftist position or hard left position where the only time they ever see anti-Semitism, it's the hard right. And the only anti-Semitism they'll talk about is the anti-Semitism of the far right. So what they'll do is, yes, they'll say, we fight anti-Semitism, we deal with anti-Semitism, we oppose anti-Semitism, look at what we did here, and they'll hold up the picture of them opposing someone with a swastika. That's the only anti-Semitism they see. Beyond that, not from the media, not from the universities, not from the politicians, from, from nowhere really in power, is there any pushback at all against the rise of anti-Semitism? Thank you. And going to the micro level, Carrie Hillebrand asks, are there any public figures, academics, or journalists trying to confront the growing anti-Zionism or anti-Semitism in Ireland? And has Israel attempted to engage in public relations? Yeah, <laughs> yeah it was, uh, okay. Firstly, of course there are. 
I mean, there's there's a um, there's a, a very small Jewish population over there. There are some uh, good Christian friends who have set up pro-Israeli groups. Um, there there have been one or two politicians who were Jewish. I think uh, the Minister of Justice until about five or six years ago uh, was Alan Shatter. He's Jewish and he was hounded out of power. Alan believes it was because he's Jewish. He believes he was hounded out of power because he was Jewish and most of the antagonists who were after him and chasing him were anti-Zionists. So I, I looked deeply into that when I was doing the research and I think he has a case. I think that Alan Shatter was pushed out of power in Ireland because he was Jewish. Um, so uh, yes, there are good people, but they're, they're outnumbered. And, and as I said, if you, don't, if you don't have support from politicians or media, it's a very lonely place to be. You need some support from somewhere that's going to give you a voice beyond just taking a megaphone and shouting in the street. You need, you need something. As for the Israeli government, I mean, when, when I published a large report after I finished my uh, research. I published a 200 page report with all of these examples in um, showing how bad it was. And the, the uh, embassy put it up on their website. Um, I, I think they know what they're dealing with. I think they're there just because they, they have to be there. But I don't think they're under any illusion about how hostile the environment is. Thank you. Lisa Bernard asks, what is Ireland's activity regarding Israel at the UN? Um, OK, I, firstly, I haven't looked to see exactly how they're voting. I can tell you they would have been voting anti most of the time. They, I, I think there was a recent, recent, recent cases, for example, where something has happened in the UN and everyone's been outraged about it and the nations have spoken up about it. Um, I think one was the recent anniversary of Durban. Um, I think there was a lot of outcry about that where a lot of the nations pulled out. And I think there was another recent one where the head of the um, UNHRC's, well, one of the main people involved in the UNHRC's current investigation of Israel was found out to be basically a rabid anti-Semite. And a lot of nations came out and criticized it and criticized the, the, the um, commission and so on. Ireland didn't. It's very, very much that's the case with them. They will side with our enemy. They will very, very rarely side with us. Thank you. Marshall Greenblatt asked, uh, you did compare uh, Ireland to, uh, uh, sorry, Scotland and, and uh, England, but how bad is the anti-Semitism in Ireland compared to countries in Europe, Germany, France, Italy, and the Netherlands? Well, again, I, I, I think the, the, the difference, firstly, there's anti-Semitism everywhere, and it, it, no doubt about it, it's been rising everywhere, and a lot of it, in my mind, is tied into the growing um, problem with Islamist extremism within Europe. I think they're, they're interlinked. Um, so yes, there's a problem, for example, in Germany with anti-Semitism. On the other hand, the German education system and German politicians in general are very, very strong because they know what anti-Semitism is. As a, as a nation, Germany um, is sides with Israel as often as most nations, apart from, apart from obviously the US. Um, so there's pushback because that's what this is about. It's about whether or not there is a pushback from wider society, from the mainstream against the anti-Semites. So in, in Germany, there's pushback. In France, even with some of the horrific problems that they have in France, and I, as I said, I'm a pessimist, and I think it's gonna go off the rails there in the next 10 or 20 years. At the moment, there's still pushback. You would, you would find support within government to fight the anti-Semitism even if at the moment it's restrained because they will do so without trying to annoy their Islamist or, you know, populations. Um, so in Ireland, that's, that's the key difference. The key difference is if you go to your MP in Ireland and you say to him, oh, I've been attacked, this anti-Semitic attack, he's likely to turn around and say, it's not anti-Semitism, it's anti-Zionism, which wouldn't happen in France, it wouldn't happen in Germany, and it wouldn't happen in the UK. There's a difference. All right, so the core 
Core question here. Jack Wasserman asks, what is the most effective way of pushing back against the anti-Zionist Semitic Irish stance? Look, I it, it depends with me because because what, what you have is you have a marriage. So for example, anti-Semitism is not a logical virus. So I've I found, and I I mean I've obviously spent many years now arguing, both talking to as a friend and arguing with these anti-Semites. Um, to try to understand the way their mind works. So when you're dealing with these people, you can't reach them through, all, all you can do is, is try to raise their level of um, cognitive dissonance, if you like, to a point where they begin to question themselves. Um, I, I normally do it by turning everything around on its head, um, just trying to show people that the Jews are not actually, um, you know, colonial invaders here, which is the key, the key problem in Ireland. I mean, I, I, I remember having a discussion, and I understand we're short of time, I remember having a discussion, I'm talking to people, I'm saying, look, these people that arrived in, in the 1930s, they were all refugees, all of them. You know, the, 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 Israel was a, a nation built up of refugees, and these refugees were attacked by the local populations. If this was happening today in Europe, you know, if a group was attacking our refugees today, you'd place them on the far right. You'd say, who are these anti-immigrant far right Nazis attacking our poor refugees? So why can't you, that kind of thing, when you turn things around on its head, I've always said, if, if you're talking to people about Jews or Israel, their, their brains go woolly. They don't see straight. So I always look for analogies that don't have anything to do with Israel and don't have anything to do with Jews and then apply it back to our case. Thank you. And you did mention that uh, Ireland has had a relatively low uh, Muslim immigration rate. Uh, do you yes. think that that would, if that increases, would would sentiments change? I, I have yet to meet a country where the Muslim population has increased and um, the situation of the Jews improved. Huh? Yeah, very fair <laughs> point. <laughs> All right. Uh, and also, you you mentioned that you you pretty much gone undercover. Can you tell us a little more about what that was like? <laughs> I had to desensitize a lot. Um, you know, it, look, it, it, it's weird um, because you actually have to immerse yourself in that culture. The, the, a new book would come out, I'd buy it, I'd read it. Um, you know, I was with these people. I was invited that by 2016, I was known amongst them as one of them. I was invited to the top table when they had events. Um, it was only really Corbyn and, and the advent of Corbyn that made me go public and say, look, I've got to go full battle now against Corbyn. I'm out. Here's all my evidence. Um, it horrible, absolutely horrible to be sitting next to people who, who are basically, I mean, Rothschild conspiracy or, or the Jews did 9-11 is light to call. You know, it's, it's soft in some of these environments. A lot of it is Holocaust denial or Holocaust they turn the Holocaust on its head so that the Zionists weren't actually the victims of the Holocaust. The Jews were, but the Zionists weren't. You know, they, they, it's, it's really uncomfortable at times, but you desensitize over a while. I mean, I was doing it for years and, and because I knew I was there for a, better, for a greater purpose, you know, I just got through it. Absolutely. Um... Sorry, I just, just lost it. Okay, Lisa Bernard asked again, what is the extent of anti-Semitism and or anti-Zionism in uh, Ireland's university? Basically, is it is it stronger among a uh, older population or, or are the young really taking on this charge? Yeah, it's, it's um, that's the scary part is, is that because Sinn Féin, it's rising with Sinn Féin and, and um, the campus, obviously everyone who's gone through the, the, the environment in the last 10, 15 years, I'd be very surprised if many of them had any kind of Zionist outlook at all, because it, it's part of the curriculum, the academics are there, it, it's part of the, the campus unions and what the, the students are doing. So I would imagine it's getting worse, certainly amongst the young. Thank you. I know you said you were independent, but can you tell our viewers where we can find some of your work? Um, it's my name with the hyphen. It's david uh, hyphen um, I have I've got a blog site there and all of my reports, including the one in Ireland, on Ireland, 
There's one on England, one on Ireland, one on Scotland. There's one on Amnesty, Interna Amnesty International that people have to read as well. Um, and if anyone, you know, but yeah, all the reports are there and I regularly post there. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you were able to join us this time. Uh, time. We've, <laughs> we've if, come anyone to the... have, if, if anyone does have any further questions that I haven't had time to answer, there's a contact me pop, like point on the, the site. Feel free to contact me. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm sure quite a few of our viewers will, will enjoy having that access. Uh, so we've come to the close of our webinar. Thank you again, Mr. Collier, for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me here. Of course. For our viewers, please join us Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern for Israel Insider this week with Navet Dromi. Thank you all for joining us, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.